Chapter Nine of the Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Nine: Love at First Sight. Shortly after Gladys reached home after her visit to the vicarage, a young man with a serious expression, somewhat out of keeping with his jaunty walk, entered the gate of Pine Cottage and came to an abrupt halt well he ejaculated this is a pretty place and what's more for dozens of houses and gardens are pretty it's artistic in front of him stretched a miniature avenue of chestnut trees which was rendered striking even to the most casual observer probably not only on account of the irregular mounds of moss-covered stones that occupied its intervening spaces but also by reason of the masses of wild flowers great clumps of which were springing up in the crevices of this impromptu wall that lent to it an appearance half negligent but wholly and entrancingly picturesque here undoubtedly was art that did not astonish the young man all avenues in the ordinary sense are works of art and the mere excess of art he saw manifested did not surprise him it was the character of the art that had brought him to a standstill and held him spellbound and the longer he looked the more he became convinced that whoever had superintended the arrangement of this scenery was an artist an artist with a scrupulous eye for form the greatest care had been taken to keep the balance between neatness and gracefulness on the one hand and picturesqueness on the other there were few straight lines and no long uninterrupted ones whilst at no one point of view did the same effect of curvature or colour appear twice variety in uniformity was the keynote at last tearing himself away from this one spot where he felt he could have spent centuries he turned to the right and then again to the left for the path had now become serpentine and at no moment could be traced for more than two or three paces in advance presently the sound of water fell gently on his ear and in the shadiest of diminutive forests amid the interlacing branches of elm and beech he caught the glimpse of a fountain for an instant the wild thought of forcing his way through it of plunging his burning forehead in its cooling spray well nigh mastered him but his better sense conquered and he kept to the path another turn and he caught his first glimpse of a chimney another and the summit of a gable showed above the trees the sun which had been hitherto obscured now came out and suddenly as if by the hand of magic the whole scene was a brilliant blaze of colour he had arrived at the end of the avenue where the path forked one branch turning sharply round in the direction of a side entrance to the house whilst the other led with a gentle curvature to the front facing the building was a broad expanse of velvety turf relieved occasionally here and there by such showy shrubs as the hydrangea rhododendron or lilac but more frequently and at closer intervals by clumps of geraniums or roses roses of every variety there was nothing pretentious in the garden any more than there was in the adjoining edifice its unusually pleasing effect lay altogether in its artistic arrangement and one could hardly help imagining that the whole scene had in reality been called into existence by the brush of some eminent landscape painter the cottage itself was constructed of old-fashioned dutch shingles broad and with rounded corners and painted a dull grey a tint which when contrasted with the vivid green of the tulip trees that overshadowed the entrance to the house and reared themselves high above it on either side afforded an artistic happiness perfectly intoxicating to its present visitor the architecture of the cottage was if not early tudor something equally pleasing its roofs were divided into many gables its windows were diamond paned and projecting whilst oaken beams ran latitudinally and vertically over its grey shingle front encompassing the whole base of the exterior were masses of flowers pinks carnations heliotrope pansies poppies lilies wallflowers roses and jasmines and besides the latter several other creepers had been planted beneath the walls but had not yet attained to any height 
Shield Davenport, for it was he, could not resist the temptation of peeping in at the windows, and he saw that the interior of the cottage was artistry and simplicity itself. At the windows, curtains of heavy white jaconette muslin, not too full, hung in sharp parallel plates to the floor, just to the floor. The walls were papered with French papers of rare delicacy, to match the seasons. Spring, summer, autumn, and winter were all most effectively depicted. And the furniture, though light, was at the same time costly. And here again was the same effect of arrangement, an arrangement obviously designed by the same brain that had planned the building and grounds. Shiel could not conceive anything more graceful. Flowers, flowers of every hue and odour, were the chief decoration of the cottage. On almost every table were vases, in themselves beautiful enough, yet filled to overflowing with the finest roses. Oxeye daisies, hollyhocks, and forget-me-nots clustered about the open windows, and every puff of wind, every puff of air transmitted scent, the most delicious medley of scent imaginable. The young man drew in deep draughts of it. He threw back his head, and, opening his mouth, reveled in the joy of feeling it steal softly down his throat and permeate his lungs. He was thus engaged when the sound of a voice brought him sharply back to earth. In the open doorway of the house, an amused expression in her violet eyes, stood a girl, so wondrously pretty, that at the sight of her Sheil was again overcome, and could only gaze in helpless admiration. "'Did you want to see my father?' she inquired. "'He is getting ready to go out, but I dare say he will see you first. "'I, I am sure he will,' the young man replied. "'I'm Sheil Davenport. I've come to tell him my uncle died at four o'clock this morning.' oh dear the girl exclaimed i am so sorry sorry for you and for my father i am sure he will be terribly upset i'm gladys martin perhaps you've heard of me i knew your uncle often shiel said and i think my uncle's description of you an excellent one his description of me yes he always spoke of you as the queen of flowers and said you had a mania for all things beautiful which was not surprising, seeing how beautiful you were yourself. "'That was very nice of him,' Gladys said, looking amused again. "'Won't you come in? If you will wait here,' she led him to the drawing-room, "'I'll tell my father.' She disappeared, and Shiel heard her run lightly up the stairs. "'By Jove!' he said to himself. "'She's the loveliest girl I've ever seen. From being so much among flowers, she has become one herself.' violets roses and heliotrope have all had a share in her creation what eyes what a mouth what teeth what hands surely i have found here not only the perfection of all things beautiful but the perfection of all things natural the perfection of natural grace in contradistinction from artificial grace moreover she is a romanticist there is an expression of romance of unworldliness in those deep-set eyes of hers that sinks into my heart of hearts romance and womanliness and the two terms appear to me to be convertible are her distinguishing features she is an artist an idealist and over and above all a woman hang it i'm in love with her more he could not evolve for his meditations were abruptly cut short by the entrance of a servant who ushered him straightway into the presence of john martin the latter though visibly affected by the news of his friend's death was a man of the world and consequently came to business at once much had to be discussed arrangements for the funeral the examination of correspondence relative to the firm and plans for the immediate future you don't know how my uncle's affairs stand i suppose shiel asked somewhat nervously yes john martin said i do may i ask if you have any private means at all or are you solely dependent on what you earn by the way what is your calling i am an artist shiel said no i've nothing beyond what my uncle was good enough to allow me an artist john martin murmured how like dick have you entertained the idea of inheriting a fortune have you any reason to suppose that your uncle was well off and had made you his heir i gathered so sir from the manner in which he lived and his attitude towards me well we won't talk it over now leave it till after the funeral are you bent on continuing painting 
there is very little remuneration in it is there not much shiel answered gloomily but i shouldn't care to give it up unless of course it is absolutely necessary for me to do so being an artist you wouldn't be much good in business none at all events you are candid well i don't see any good in our dallying here i had best go back with you to sydenham i've got a letter to write first but i shan't be long he was long enough however for shield to have another chat with gladys do you believe in dreams she asked him i had such a queer one last night about trees and flowers and oddly enough my father also dreamed of trees and flowers and of the very same ones too i am going into town to-day to consult a firm that has just set up called the modern sorcery company limited they profess to interpret dreams and i am anxious to see whether they can in cockspur street aren't they shiel asked i saw their advertisement in one of the papers i presume you are not going there alone no gladys laughed i shall go with a friend though i often do go into town alone i can assure you i am quite capable of looking after myself in that respect at least i am quite up to date perhaps you are more accustomed to french girls yes i have spent most of my life in paris shiel said but how could you tell that oh i guessed you were an artist and had probably spent some time in paris gladys rejoined by the way you looked at the house and garden i could read appreciation in your eyes and gesture and such appreciation as i knew could only come from an artist g w barnett helped me in planning this cottage in the garden what barnett the landscape painter i am a great admirer of his work were you a pupil of his yes he was one of the visiting r a s at the beechcraft studio in st john's wood where i worked for three years we were then living in blackheath st john's park a hateful place mr barnett was awfully good when i told him we were moving and that i wanted to live in really artistic surroundings he suggested that i should be my own architect and promised to do everything he could to assist me and your father hadn't a say in the matter shiel commented with an amused smile not in that gladys said complacently but there are one or two things in which he has a very decided say father can be very self-willed and obstinate when he likes but as i was remarking when you interrupted me i beg pardon shiel murmured mr barnett promised to assist me he came over here with me and we chose this site is he an old man shiel inquired a trifle anxiously not much more than middle-aged fifty perhaps gladys said though he looks much younger he is still very good-looking well he came over here we chose this site and is he married no oh, really you seem very interested in him perhaps you will meet him some day he comes here a good deal as i was saying we chose the site together and he supervised the plans i drew up for the garden and cottage i don't think perhaps i should have thought of that avenue if it hadn't been for him at all events it does you both credit shiel remarked for a more charming house and garden i have never seen i should like to live here all my life i should like but he was interrupted by john martin come it's time we were off the latter called out brusquely time and trains wait for no man a young ass john martin whispered in gladys ear as the trio passed through the entrance of the railway station on to the platform not a bit of good to me don't encourage him whatever you do encourage him gladys retorted indignantly seeing that shiel who had his ticket to get was out of hearing do i encourage any one all the same she added defiantly i rather like him it isn't every one's good fortune to be as smart as you john martin quick hurry up that's your train and the guard's about to blow his whistle with a vigorous push she hustled her father into the first compartment they came to and shiel sprang in after him as the train moved out of the station an hour later gladys looking extremely demure and proper was rapping with a daintily gloved hand at the inquiry office in the great stone lobby of the modern sorcery company's building in cockspur street have you an appointment madam the commissionaire in a bright blue uniform asked no gladys replied is it necessary 
the firm are unusually busy the man explained and unless you have made an appointment with them some days beforehand it is doubtful whether they will be able to see you however if you will step into the waiting-room and fill in one of the forms you see on the table i will take it to them which member of the firm have you come to consult i haven't the slightest idea gladys said i want to have a dream interpreted then that will be mr kelson the man observed he does all that kind of thing tells dreams characters pasts and reads thoughts mr curtis solves all manner of puzzles and tricks and mr hamar divines the presence of metals and water there is a lady in the waiting-room now come to have a dream interpreted she's been there nearly an hour this way madam and he escorted rather than ushered gladys into a large elaborately furnished room in which a dozen or so well-dressed people of both sexes were waiting looking over the leaves of magazines and journals and trying in vain to hide their only too obvious excitement having filled in the necessary form and given it to the commissionaire gladys looked round for a seat and espying one next to a strikingly handsome girl she at once appropriated it there was something about this showy girl that had attracted gladys she was one of those rare people that have a personality and although this was a personality that gladys was not at all sure she liked nevertheless she felt anxious to become more closely acquainted with it both girls suddenly realized that they were staring hard at one another the girl with the personality was the first to speak with a smile that while revealing a perfect set of white teeth at the same time revealed exceedingly thin lips she remarked it's most wearisome work waiting i've been here nearly an hour i shouldn't stay any longer only i've come from a distance london is so hot and stuffy i detest it do you gladys observed i don't i find it so full of human interest indeed of every kind of interest not that i should care to live in it but i like being near enough to come up several times a week i live at kew then you're lucky the girl said i'd live at kew if i could but i can't i'm one of those unfortunate creatures who have to earn their living sometimes i wish i had to gladys remarked do you then you don't know much about it it isn't all jam by a long way i loathe work i've been spending my holiday at kew i've just come from there are you by any chance miss rosenberg gladys asked that's my name the girl replied with a look of astonishment how do you know gladys explained i've just been to the vicarage she said and mrs spratt has told me about the verses did you really dream them of course i shouldn't have said so if i hadn't miss rosenberg replied angrily i don't tell crams besides i have never composed a line of poetry in my life the verses were repeated to me in my sleep by some occult agency of that i am quite certain they were so vividly impressed on my mind that i had no difficulty at all in remembering them every one of them and i got up and wrote them down of course they must mean something gladys was about to make some observation when the commissioner opening the door of the room called out miss rosenberg whereupon with a sigh of relief miss rosenberg took her departure end of chapter nine read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter ten of the sorcery club by elliot o'donnell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter ten how the dreams were interpreted tell miss rosenberg i'll see her now matt kelson said and as he leaned back in his luxurious chair with that dignity of self-assurance only the man who is rich can maintain it was hard to realize that he and the matt kelson of a year ago were the same a year ago he had been a poor underpaid ill-nourished pen-driver with all the odious marks of a pen-driver's servility thick upon him it was true he had been fastidious as to his appearance that is to say as fastidious as any one could be who has to buy clothes ready-made and can only afford to pay a few dollars for them that he had sacrificed meals to wear white shirts boiled shirts as one called them in san francisco and to get his things got up decently at a respectable laundry 
but his teeth in those days did not receive the attention they ought to have received he could not afford a dentist the tobacco he smoked was often offensive and there were to be found in him sundry other details that one usually finds in clerks and in most other people who literally have to fight for a living but now all that was changed kelson was rich he bought his suits at pool's his hats at christie's his boots in regent street he patronized a dentist in cavendish square and a manicurist in bond street he belonged to a crack club in pall mall and never smoked anything but the most expensive cigars his ambition had been speedily realized he had passionately longed to be a fop he was one the only thing that troubled him was that he could not be an aristocrat at the same time but after all what did that matter the girls looked at him all the same and that was all he wanted he worshipped he adored pretty girls and he was most anxious that they should adore him consequently his first thought when he saw lilian rosenberg's name on the form the commissioner presented him was is she pretty and the first thing he said to himself directly the door opened to admit her was by jove she is then he assumed an air more suited to a partner in a big london firm and flourishing a richly bejewelled hand said pray take a seat madam what can i do for you i want you to tell me the meaning of these verses lilian rosenberg said handing him two sheets of foolscap and then sitting down they were suggested to me in my sleep in other words i dreamed them you dreamed them did you kelson said noticing with approval that the girl had well kept white hands and that her clothes though not particularly expensive were chic and up to date do you want me only to interpret this poem or shall i tell you something about yourself first by all means tell me something about myself first if you can lillian rosenberg said i want to get as much as i can out of you your fees are exorbitant very well then kelson rejoined with a smile don't blame me if i tell you too much you were born at sea being a troublesome girl at home you were sent to a boarding school where you distinguished yourself in various ways and last but not least by making the headmistress a married woman desperately jealous this led to your being removed removed is a more delicate term than expelled am i right yes i believe you are inspired by the devil shall i go on y yes i think so yes go on please you came home your mother died your father married again you disliked your stepmother you considered she ill-treated you she did i won't dispute it at all events you had your revenge you pretended to commit suicide and wrote several letters to the police amongst others declaring that you were about to drown yourself owing to the cruelty of your stepmother and so cleverly did you manage it that everyone believed you were drowned and blamed your stepmother accordingly changing your name to lillian rosenberg you came direct to london for some time you worked in a milliner's shop in beecham gardens and then you set up as a manicurist in woodstock street among your clients was the wife of the vicar of st catherine's kew who took a great liking to you you have extraordinary personal magnetism unable however to do more than pay your way at legitimate manicuring you that will do lillian rosenberg cried a faint flow of colour pervading her cheeks that will do explain the verses as you will kelson said but mind i don't insist on the necessity of your paying the slightest heed to my explanation according to the usual method of interpreting dreams the valley of flowers is symbolical of innocence and self-restraint of that path in life with which the goody-goody say every young lady should be satisfied the hunter is representative of the love of change and excitement the horse of self-indulgent the misty moon means ruin the metamorphosis into the crawling phantasm death leave the path of virtue and give way to self-indulgence and a craving for everlasting change and excitement and a miserable ending will be your mead and has been the mead of all others who have done the same thing then the dream is a warning kelson was about to reply when the door opened and hamar with an apology for intruding beckoned him 
he spoke with him for several moments relative to a matter of some consequence and then glancing at miss rosenberg and drawing kelson still further aside whispered let me caution you again matt on no account let your soft feelings for the other sex get the better of you remember it is imperative for us to do evil not good to lead our clients into temptation not out of it i am doing my best to follow the injunctions of the unknown but we must all work in harmony that is the most vital point in our compact and you know if we do not keep the compact something frightful will happen to us i cannot impress this fact on you too much only yesterday i had to pull you up for giving good advice to a lady damn your good advice give her bad bad advice i say anything that will do people harm no matter whether they are ugly or pretty and if you are not jolly well careful pretty girls will be your and our undoing i see you have a pretty girl here right now and from what i can read in her face she is not a saint rub it into her rub it into her well persuade her to be a bigger sinner still now i can't wait to say more i must go i asked you lilian rosenberg said as kelson resumed his seat if the dream was a warning no kelson said i shouldn't take it as such despite the rather peculiar form it took i am inclined to think it isn't a dream with any real significance but merely a chance dream a dream compounded of sayings and actions of the past that have come back to you all higgledy-piggledy as they so often do in dreams you learned a lot of poetry i suppose when you were at school yes but none like this no i didn't suppose so but the mere fact that your mind was at one time used to verses acquainted with metre and rhythm would account for the form adopted by your dream i assure you it was purely chance and that there is no significance in it you are on the lookout for work is it not so i am lillian rosenberg said can you tell me where to go to get it i am just thinking kelson replied i believe my partner mr hamar wants a secretary i can't of course say whether you would suit him do you type i can type and do shorthand lillian rosenberg replied eagerly and i can correspond in german and french and the salary would two hundred a year do yes after a slight pause i could make it do i should want one half holiday from one o'clock every week and sundays and three days holiday in the summer and one at christmas and of course the usual bank holidays i see kelson said thoughtfully you want plenty of time for amusement well i will speak about it to mr hamar and if you leave me your address i will give it to him how nicely you keep your hands i manicure them every day lillian rosenberg said then looking up at him from under the long lashes which swept her cheeks she added you won't forget to tell mr hamar about me will you i am very anxious to get a post you don't know what it is to be hard up do you the earnest pleading expression in her long dark eyes appealed to kelson as nothing else had ever appealed to him since his arrival in london he had seen many pretty faces many beautiful eyes but assuredly none so lovely as these and what features what teeth what lips what a chin what a figure it seemed to him that she was not like an ordinary girl that she was not of the same composition as any of the girls he had ever met that she was something hardly human something elfish something generated by the beautiful english woods and glades filled with the soft glamour of the moon and stars and all the while he was thinking thus his heart rising in rebellion against the words of hamar the girl continued gazing up at him and toying with the rings on her slender milk-white fingers at last he dare look at her no longer but stammering out his promise to do all he could to get her the vacant post he pressed her hand gently and bade her good morning then he returned to his chair and leaning back in it was seeing again in his mind's eye the fair face of the girl who had just left him when there was a rap at the door and the commissionaire announced miss martin another of them kelson said to himself and about as pretty in her way as the last now i wonder what she wants he looked closely at her but no past rose up before him as far as this client was concerned his power of divination in that direction was nil she was a blank i've come to ask you the meaning of a dream i had last night she began inwardly shuddering at the sight of so much pomade and jewellery yes he said with an encouraging smile what was it 
of course she did not tell him all but merely that she had dreamed of certain flowers and trees as curiously enough so had her father kelson looked at her thoughtfully once he opened his mouth to speak and then checked himself and it was some seconds before he actually broke silence taken separately he said at last the ash tree portends an unexpected visit a poppy a visit from a man red roses falling in love lilac a present a willow kisses heaps of them bluebells a proposal brambles difficulties in the way for example tiresome relatives buttercups a marriage an ash tree a son and an heir a dear little thank you gladys remarked rising frigidly thank you i will go now what is your fee i trust madam you are pleased kelson said in great distress will you kindly take your fee and let me out gladys demanded as he nervously placed himself in her way thank you good morning and as she swept regally past him and down the stone passage hamar came out of his room and passed by her on his way to kelson's office ye gods he exclaimed eyeing the discomfited kelson wrathfully what in the world have you done to offend the lady i never saw any one look so angry in my life damn it all i hope you didn't insult her it was all your fault kelson wailed she asked me to tell her the meaning of a dream which was brimful of warnings against us against us yes against us i have never listened to such admonitions in a dream before she must have some very friendly spirits watching over her well what was i to do i did my best mindful of what you said to me a short time ago i put her entirely off the track gave her an entirely misleading and as i thought very pleasant interpretation of the dream what did you say kelson told him jackass hamar exclaimed jackass you were far too broad what pleases a san francisco girl shocks a london lady for goodness sake have more tact next time we don't want to get into hot water i feel quite convinced that if any harm befalls us if that compact is in any way broken it will be through you i wish to heaven the unknown had given you some other power so do i kelson groaned at all events hamar went on the first three months is nearly at an end who was she miss gladys martin where does she live i don't know i could divine nothing about her she can't have any vices i don't suppose she has hamar remarked dryly not from the look of her anyway but there is time yet matt i've taken a fancy to that girl and i mean to get hold of her somehow i wonder if she is related to martin davenport's partner jerusalem what sport if she is why why sport kelson asked don't don't you see martin is at our mercy we are more than his rivals we can drive him out of london any moment we like his tricks indeed pshaw curtis can do them all right off the reel and curtis shall we will show martin up make a laughing-stock of him ruin him unless 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 what great scott don't look so alarmed unless supposing that girl is his daughter unless he gives me permission to pay my addresses to her and hamar laughed coarsely End of chapter ten read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter eleven of the sorcery club by elliot o'donnell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter eleven leon hamar calls on the martins where's gladys john martin asked as he rose with an effort stiff and tired from the remains of a meat tea in reply miss templeton merely pointed a finger and went on crocheting following the direction indicated john martin stepped out on to the lawn and glancing round the garden called gladys then he listened and there came to him snatches of a song the words of which full of arch sentiment allied with and to a large extent dependent on a unique knowledge of and love of nature would not have disgraced a herrick or a raleigh the music a schubert or a sullivan 
john martin had spared no money in educating gladys and she did him credit he thought so now as exhausted from a hard day's poring over letters he paused and leaned his back against a tree a gentle breeze blew her notes to him full of melody and mirth fresh and young and tender as tender as the rosebuds and violets that nestled at her bosom by jove john martin murmured fancy my having a daughter like gladys i ought to be jolly well pleased and so i am the only thing i fear is that she'll marry someone who isn't half good enough for her but who would be good enough for her god alone knows and god alone knows whether she or i ought to decide gladys hello and the next moment a vision in pink emerged from the bushes gladys i want to confide in you what's wrong daddy dear gladys said thrusting an arm through his and walking him gently along with her through the glade you weren't at all nice to me when we parted this morning but you look so wearied that i'll be magnanimous and forgive you what is it why it's like this john martin said putting his arm around her and holding her close to him as he used to do when a little girl she came sidling up to him for sugar plums poor dick's affairs are in a terrible muddle unknown to me he speculated right and left and he has not only muddled through everything he had but he has left a number of debts and unfortunately i have to meet them you father but why you gladys cried because they were incurred in the name of the firm i can meet them all right but it will be a big drain on my resources that's worry number one worry number two is about young davenport shiel i don't know what to do about him he was entirely dependent on dick his work as an artist doesn't bring him in enough to keep him in tobacco and the worst of it is he doesn't seem capable of turning his hand to anything else i can't see him starve so i shall have to allow him something he seemed to me very intelligent gladys observed couldn't you take him into the firm who are you going to have in his uncle's place that's the trouble john martin replied i do feel i want someone i am getting on in years my brain is not so vigorous as it used to be and i can't go on inventing fresh tricks ad infinitum moreover i need assistance in the purely business side of the concern i want someone who is both business-like and inventive someone young brilliant and reliable you couldn't sell out i suppose no not just at present thanks to poor old dick the firm is in rather a precarious condition another six months over and we may be perfectly all right no i must stick on and get another partner and you look here gladys you know i let you do pretty nearly everything you like but let me beg of you not to be too friendly with that young davenport i caught him looking very impressively at you this morning and i am quite sure if he sees anything more of you he will be falling head over ears in love which is the very last thing in the world i want that's making me out to be very attractive daddy gladys said looking round at him mischievously and so you are dear john martin said wonderfully attractive and none knows it better than yourself but in this case you must think of consequences consequences that might be disastrous to us all confound it who's this what on earth does he want gladys gazed in astonishment a young and very smartly dressed man was advancing towards them with a soft cat-like tread he was of medium height and slim build his head disproportionately large his right ear standing out in proof that it had long been used as a pen-rest his nose pronounced and semitic in outline his eyes big projecting and yellowish-brown his chin retreating his complexion dark and saturnine gladys shivered what a horrible person she whispered there is something positively uncanny about him i feel cold all over and how he stares yes what is it john martin demanded do you want to see me you're mr martin i reckon the stranger replied in the soft drawl characteristic of california i've come to have a little talk with you on business with me on business john martin cried i don't know you i've never seen you before 
you see me now anyway the stranger laughed casting approving eyes at gladys my name's leon hamar and i've come to talk over that show of yours damn your impudence john martin said raising his stick threateningly how dare you intrude upon me here on such a pretext calmly calmly sir hamar cried his cheeks paling i've come here with every intention of being civil i am chief partner in the modern sorcery company limited and as conjuring figures prominently in our programme i thought you might prefer to have us as friends rather than rivals i am sure my father need not fear your rivalry gladys broke in meeting hamar's admiring gaze stonily if he said you desire a proof of our ability to accomplish what we profess i will give that proof without delay with your prayer you have no permission from me sir john martin cried fiercely go hamar merely shrugged his shoulders you ought not to get so heated he said considering that exactly twenty feet below where you are standing is a spring all you have to do is to mark the spot and sink a well and there will be no need for you to use the company's water as you are probably aware spring water is a thousand times clearer and purer also he went on stepping hastily back as john martin again raised his stick in the trunk of that elm over yonder is a hollow about eight feet from the ground and if you look inside it you will discover an iron box full of curios and jewellery shall i no retorted john martin if you don't go instantly i'll send for the police and hamar coming to the conclusion that upon this occasion discretion was better than valour hurriedly beat a retreat you'll be sorry john martin he shouted from a safe distance and so will miss gladys charming miss gladys but remember you have only yourselves to blame ta ta and the next moment he was lost to sight well gladys ejaculated of all the beastly cads i have ever seen he fairly takes the biscuit what colossal cheek the idea of his coming here and speaking to us like that can't we prosecute him father hardly john martin replied best leave him alone i wish he hadn't come he's upset me my nerves are anyhow which was the tree he spoke about this one gladys exclaimed walking up to an elm and patting it with her hand but you surely don't believe what he said do you it was all rubbish from the start to finish daddy my dear old daddy i do believe you are worrying about it hold my hat and stick a moment john martin said and making a spring which for one of his age and weight showed surprising agility he succeeded in catching hold of one of the nearest lateral branches the elm being old the bark had become very gnarled and uneven and thus the difficulty of ascension lay more in semblance perhaps than in reality embracing the large trunk as closely as possible with his arms and knees much to the detriment of his clothes seizing with his hands some projections and resting his feet upon others john martin after one or two narrow escapes from falling at length wriggled himself into the first great fork and paused to wipe his forehead oh do take care father gladys pleaded you'll fall and break your neck do be sensible and come down now but john martin paid no attention he went on groping i found it he suddenly shouted that bounder was right the trunk is hollow he was silent then for some minutes and gladys could only see his boots then there was a muffled oath a sound of choking and gasping which made gladys blood run cold and then a great cry there's something here something hard and heavy it's a box an iron box take it from me and leaning as far down as he dared he placed in gladys outstretched hands a rusty iron box then there was the sound of scraping and tearing and john martin gradually lowered himself to the ground his coat covered with green and the knees of his trousers ripped to pieces gladys ran indoors for a hammer and chisel and the hinges of the box being worn with age and exposure it was but the work of a few seconds to break it open it was full of gold and silver coins and jewellery there were only a few gold pieces the greater number of the coins were silver the bulk georgian and their dates ranged from sixteen ninety seven to seventeen fifty the jewellery consisted of several massive gold bracelets two or three of very fine workmanship and some dozen or so plain gold rings two silver watches and a varied assortment of silver trinkets 
all were more or less antique but none apart from the gold bracelets of any great value well john martin exclaimed as they concluded their examination of the articles what do you make of it why that man put them there of course gladys said can't you see the whole thing is nothing but a dodge to intimidate you into forming a friendship with him i dare say he has heard that mr davenport is dead and thinks he sees an opportunity to be taken into partnership he had a horrid face sly and cunning and his way of looking at me was positively disgusting it makes me feel sick and horrid even to think of it what shall we do with these things john martin asked picking up one of the watches and eyeing it with curiosity are they ours gladys replied i certainly consider we've a right to keep them her father said since we've found them ourselves on our property but i suppose legally they are treasure trove and ought to be given up and surely the government would pay us something for them wouldn't it i should think so at least a decent government would anyhow i think to give them up will be our best course i doubt if the whole lot is worth fifty pounds where was it he said there was water good gracious gladys exclaimed you don't mean to say you are going to bother about that now it was here i think john martin went on thrusting his stick in the ground to the best of my knowledge and i had experts advice there is no water anywhere near here had there been i should not have gone to the expense of having pipes laid down to feed the pond oh father how can you be so silly gladys cried of course there isn't any water there it's only a trick a trick to frighten you and i'm beginning to think it has succeeded i shall try here anyway to-morrow john martin said grimly let us go in now when gladys went into the garden on the following morning she beheld an extraordinary sight her father the gardener and a man whom she did not recognize at first as his back was turned towards her but who to her utter astonishment proved to be shiel davenport were hard at work digging a pit her father paused every now and then and rested but he did not allow the others a moment's respite every time they were about to slack he urged them on it was all very well for the gardener who was accustomed to it but it was obviously killing work for shiel davenport and gladys as soon as she had overcome a preliminary outburst of laughter gave vent to her sympathies what a shame she exclaimed father how can you poor mr davenport looks ready to drop take a rest mr davenport do you have my permission looking very hot and exhausted shiel davenport threw down his spade and attempted to make himself presentable his clothes will be ruined father gladys said indignantly they're not his clothes he's wearing an old suit of mine john martin explained trying to appear unconcerned shiel forced a laugh i'm rather out of form miss martin i haven't had much exercise lately you're getting it now anyway john martin chuckled and it's blistered your hands horribly gladys cried pointing to several raw places i will fetch you a pair of father's gloves he's a brute please don't trouble shiel exclaimed i'll use my handkerchief instead digging is even harder work than painting in one way it's not fit work for you gladys replied with another reproachful glance at her father when did you arrive i never heard you i phoned to him last night john martin said looking rather sheepish i thought a day out here would do him good he thought so too and came on by the seven o'clock train we've been digging ever since breakfast but a bit of exercise won't hurt him and i'll give him plenty of vaseline presently they resumed work again and gladys retired indoors at eleven o'clock john martin let shiel go you can amuse yourself to luncheon with books and papers he said you'll find plenty of them in my study i'll join you later but shiel had other ideas of amusing himself and as soon as he had washed and changed back into his own clothes he followed the sounds of music until he reached the drawing-room i'm sure you must feel dreadfully tired gladys said leaving off playing it was too bad of father to make you work like that i'm afraid your father thinks me a very useless article shiel replied seating himself in an easy chair and trying his hardest not to look too ardently and an artist is not much good outside his profession who is gladys smiled shall you still go on painting now that my uncle has died it all depends depends on whether he has been able to leave me anything in his will from one or two things your father has said i fear he has not 
in which case i don't quite know what i shall do i could hardly expect mr martin to take me into his firm aren't you any good at invention gladys asked i know he wants someone who is someone who can help him devise fresh tricks this everlasting racking of the brains to think of something new is beginning to be too much for him i wish i could be of some use shiel said both for his sake and mine and may i add yours anyhow i'll try i have a certain amount of imagination i suppose most artists have and henceforth i'll devote it to trickery no not to trickery gladys said to conjuring well to conjuring then to planning something novel and startling in the way of a trick and as they say two heads are better than one perhaps you will help me i gladys laughed why i've never invented anything in my life barring a song nevertheless i'm sure you would be of great help to me shiel said you would at least criticize my efforts wouldn't you oh i should certainly do that gladys laughingly rejoined and probably do more harm than good you could never do any harm shiel said with so much eagerness that gladys got up and began searching for a piece of music i would give anything to paint you i have been painted twice gladys observed for the r a yes i didn't much care about it and i grew desperately tired of sitting who painted you hennebleau painted me once and darker painted me once then it's useless for me even to think of it how did they treat you in their pictures hennebleau painted me in evening dress and darker painted me in the character of enid you know the enid in the idols of the king yes but i should like to paint you as melody in flowerland i'm afraid i can't grasp it gladys said can't you shiel exclaimed i can the idea came to me when i heard you singing just now and saw you sitting here in the midst of flowers and dressed like a rose i should paint you clad as you are now all in pink seated in the garden singing and all the flowers leaning towards you listening i would give anything to paint it and he spoke with such enthusiasm that gladys remembering her dream flushed i think she said we might go into the garden and see how the work is progressing i fear i can't do any more digging shiel put in hastily i willingly would if i could but i really can't use my hands and you've not had any vaseline gladys cried i'll get you some and before he could prevent her she had gone she was back again however in a few moments with a tiny white jar and some linen bandages i couldn't find my aunt she began or she would bandage your hands for you won't you shiel asked do he thrust his hands toward her as he spoke and gladys uttered an exclamation of horror the palms and fingers were raw and swollen i feel heartily ashamed of myself for being so thin-skinned shiel said but gladys had disappeared she returned almost immediately with a bowl of water i'm sure they must hurt you dreadfully she exclaimed as she gently bathed the hands it makes me feel quite ill to see them for the next few moments shiel was in paradise the touch of her cool white fingers on his hot and burning skin was far nicer than anything he had ever imagined her sweet-scented breath stealing gently up his nostrils soothed away all his care even the remembrance of his recent loss with his whole heart and soul concentrated in his gaze he watched her every movement watched the waving and tossing of the stray wisps of hair over her temples and ears as the breeze rustled through the open windows and the gentle tightening and relaxation of her delicately moulded lips each time she breathed shiel had always had a very solitary existence apart from his uncle he had no near relatives and with the exception of the five or six weeks in the year he had spent at dick davenport's house in sydenham he had always been in rooms he had often felt lonely but never quite so lonely as now now that the only person he had known intimately and for whom he had entertained any real affection was suddenly taken away he was now absolutely alone in the world and the poignancy of his position came home to him acutely it is a terrible thing to be lonely lonely men do all sorts of dreadful things things they would certainly never dream of doing if they had companionship and shiel was doing a dreadful thing now every moment he was falling more and more desperately in love despite the fact that he had no money and worse still no prospects of ever making any 
and loneliness was in the main responsible for it had he not been so lonely had he not spent days and days alone in lodgings with no one to talk to no one to care whether he were ill or dying had this not been his experience the experience he was even then undergoing reason would have outweighed folly and even though he might have realized that in gladys martin he had found his ideal of beauty of womanliness he would have been content only to admire as it was he was in that very dangerous mood when the heart yearns for sympathy when a plain woman's sympathy means much and a pretty woman's more than much it is no exaggeration to say that shiel would have lain down and died for gladys ten times over for her sake if only to see her smile no mere physical pain would have been too excruciating for him to bear and when she put the finishing touches to the bandages and quite by chance of course their eyes met he looked at her as if he never meant to leave off looking at her as if he never meant to do anything else but look at her for all eternity whether she understood as much or not is impossible to say Sheel asked himself the question over and over again before the day was out, and in his sleep, and during the next day, and for many days afterwards. Could she tell how much he admired her, how much he worshipped her, all that he was prepared to do for her sweet sake? All this he asked himself repeatedly, and went on thinking of her when he knew he ought never to have thought of her at all. "'I'm sure your hands are more comfortable now.' won't you go into the garden and see how the work is progressing she said or if you are afraid father will want you to dig again perhaps you would like to go into his study and read the papers i should like to stay here and listen to you singing he said mayn't i do that you might she said but i have to go out then i'll stay here till you return he said i've never been in such a delightful room what do you think of shield davenport gladys remarked to her aunt a few minutes later i don't think i've ever met such an extraordinary young man he does nothing but stare at me and when i ask him to do one thing he suggests doing another he's the most difficult person to manage in fact i can't manage him at all never mind about managing him my dear miss templeton replied so long as you don't let him manage you young men who do nothing but stare are not merely difficult they are dangerous end of chapter eleven read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter twelve of the sorcery club by elliot o'donnell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter twelve the great challenge when john martin came in to tea that afternoon he gave gladys a shock despite the fact that he had been in the sun all day and was much tanned in consequence he had never looked so gladys thought so old and haggard you dear old daddy she said hastening to pour him out some tea you shouldn't work so hard this silly digging has quite knocked you up haven't you finished yes i've finished john martin said catching his breath i found water nonsense it's true all the same we struck it at exactly the distance he said twenty feet and of course he knew how how in the deuce could he have known i can't say gladys replied all i know is that he's not straight and that there's some underhand trickery going on but do have your tea now and dismiss it from your mind anyhow he can do you no harm here's a letter for you john mrs templeton exclaimed entering the room at that moment john martin took it from her and tore open the envelope curiously it was a handwriting he did not know and did not like its characteristics were sinister i knew it he cried i knew the fellow was a scoundrel what the deuce do you think he has the impertinence to do now he gladys said looking anxiously at her father whoever do you mean why that confounded young bounder who came here last night leon hamar he signs himself in this letter he declares that he can perform any of our tricks and will accept the wager i offered for their solution some little time ago he also says that unless i consent to see him and to listen courteously to what he has to say he will publicly announce his intention of taking up the wager at our hall 
in kingsway to-night do you think there is any possibility of his having discovered the secrets of your tricks gladys asked could he have bribed anyone to tell him i don't think so john martin said the only people who have any clue as to how they are done are my two attendants both as you know natives of cashmere and men who i feel pretty certain could not be got at in that case gladys remarked i fail to see what there is to worry about your course is perfectly clear take no notice of it john martin was silent dazed he did not know what to think or do there was something painfully ominous to him in the discovery of the money and the water something that accentuated the impression hamar's sinister experience had made on him the man did not look ordinary his manner gestures walk and expression were decidedly abnormal in fact they put him in mind of the superphysical the superphysical might not that account for his knowledge bah there was no such thing as the superphysical the man was extraordinary but after all only a man his knowledge only that of a man and it must be as the shrewd gladys conjectured he had put the money in the tree himself and had learned the presence of water through some subtle artifice perhaps only guessed at it he would defy him let him do what he would this was john martin's decision as he finished tea an hour later he had changed his mind and was speaking to hamar on the telephone expressing his willingness to grant him a brief interview if he came at once in rather less than an hour a motor drew up at the martin's door and hamar stepped out of it glad to find you in a more tractable mood mr martin he exclaimed on being ushered into the latter's presence i reckoned you would sing to a different tune when you found that water would you like me to give you a few more samples of my skill before we proceed to business name your business at once john martin replied gruffly i haven't many minutes to spare no hamar said that's a pity because part of what i have at the back of my brain may take more than a few minutes arranging the situation in a nutshell is this you have a pretty daughter mr martin how dare you sir john martin broke in clenching his fist gently gently mr martin hamar observed backing towards the door gently you promised to give me a courteous hearing i meant no offence i say i admire your daughter immensely she takes the shine out of our american girls the deuce she does john martin foamed she does you bet hamar went on and i see no reason if she likes me why we couldn't get engaged i would do the thing handsomely as far as money goes what do you say i say that unless you're very careful i shall break my promise and kick you i would pay you a big lump sum to take me into partnership hamar went on complacently and i would introduce a number of new tricks that would stagger creation i shouldn't be in any hurry to marry the length of the engagement would be for you to decide then it would be ad infinitum john martin said grimly for you'll never get my consent to a marriage never is a long day and even a john martin may change you want new blood and new capital in your firm you would have both in me i assure you your show would boom as it has never boomed before and the only condition on which you offer me all this is my daughter you have said it that is the one and only condition your daughter my brains my dollars i have decided john martin said good hamar exclaimed i guessed you would there's nothing like the almighty dollar is there yes john martin rejoined the almighty fist and that's what you'll get if you don't clear out of this house instantly and if you ever come skulking round here again or write me any more letters i'll set my solicitor on to you then it's war war to the knife hamar sneered how melodramatic but it won't last long i shall yet be your partner and i shall yet have miss gladys au revoir i won't say good-bye and with a mock bow he hurriedly took his departure that night messieurs martin and davenport's entertainment had progressed as usual for about half an hour when it suddenly came to a full stop a man in the lowest tier of boxes had risen and was addressing the audience in a loud voice ladies and gentlemen in an instant all heads swung round and there were stentorian shouts of silence but curtis for it was he was not easily daunted do you call this fair play he demanded 
i am here to-night to make a sporting offer and one which will afford you vast entertainment cries of shut up silence he's drunk turn him out merging into one loud roar forced him to pause several uniformed officials now invaded the box but hamar who as well as kelson was with curtis fixing them with his big dark eyes that gleamed eerily in the half-lowered lights of the house for the stage only at that moment was fully illuminated held them in check and they hung back not knowing what to do this move of hamar's took with a large section of the audience some of whom were possessed with sporting instincts whilst well, others were merely curious and the somewhat premature cries of turn him out etc were soon lost in and vociferous shouts of let them alone let them speak let us hear what they have to say it was in the midst of this hubbub that john martin in a great state of nervous agitation came to the front of the stage and inquired the cause of the commotion the shouting still continued and gladys who had come to the performance anticipating something of the sort called to her father from the wings bidding him give curtis permission to speak you will lose all sympathy if you don't father she added and besides you have nothing to fear it's sheer bravado and impudence on their part thus advised for gladys was a level-headed girl john martin gave in and the audience showed their approval by a vigorous round of clapping i wish i were spokesman kelson said his eyes glistening at the sight of so many pretty upturned faces go on old man he said giving curtis a nudge fire away and show them you know a bit about elocution for the credit of the firm curtis needed no encouragement what little bashfulness he had once possessed he had certainly left behind in san francisco for he leaned over the front of the box and smiled familiarly at the audience i am edward curtis he said one of the directors of the modern sorcery company limited monsieurs martin and davenport have so often boasted that no one outside of their firm can perform their tricks that i have come here to-night resolved to disillusion them i not only accept their offer of ten thousand pounds for the solution of their tricks but i agree to pay them double that amount cash down if i do not do everything they do from the brass coffin to their world-famed pumpkin puzzle with messrs martin and davenport's permission i will explain one and all of their tricks to you to-night and the only thing i ask of you ladies and gentlemen is to see that i get fair play a spontaneous outburst of clapping followed his speech and as soon as it had ceased one of the audience who had risen and was waiting to speak said i trust messrs martin and davenport will accept this challenge and allow the modern sorcery company the opportunity here in this hall to-night of displaying their skill or their ignorance as the case may be if messrs martin and davenport's tricks cannot be performed by any outsider the firm in accepting this challenge will be twenty thousand pounds the richer and if as is hardly likely messrs martin and davenport should be outwitted i am sure they themselves will be amongst the first to congratulate their successful rivals i for one am quite ready to act as referee i too shouted a dozen other voices be a sport and accept his bet ladies and gentlemen john martin replied with dignity you have given me no alternative i accept the challenge perhaps those who have so kindly volunteered to act as referees will see that order is maintained whilst i go on with my performance at the conclusion of which mr curtis i think that is the name of my rival will be quite at liberty to try his exposition of my tricks the performance then proceeded and when it was over curtis hamar and kelson accompanied by six of those of the audience who had volunteered to act as referees stepped on to the stage seats were provided for the referees three on the one side of the stage and three on the other and having seen that everything was fair and square john martin retired to the o p wing behind which gladys was concealed a brief description of the brass coffin trick which was the first messrs hamar curtis and kelson proceeded to explain will perhaps suffice a massively constructed brass-bound coffin is handed round to the audience who carefully examine it and being unable to discover anything amiss pronounce themselves satisfied that it is genuine the operator then summons an assistant jokingly refers to him as the corpse puts him into a sack made to represent a winding-sheet 
securely binds the sack with a piece of cord and asks one of the audience to seal it the sack and its contents are then placed in the coffin which is locked and corded the operator then throws a sheet over the coffin lets it remain there for a few seconds and on removing it and opening the lid the coffin is found to be empty a shout from the front of the house makes everyone turn round when to their amazement the corpse is seen standing up at the back of the pit holding the sack with the rope and seal intact in his hand such was the marvellous feat which had been accomplished in martin and davenport's hall night in and night out for years the solution of which no one as yet had been able to discover one can imagine in these circumstances the tremendous excitement of the audience at the prospect of seeing this notorious puzzle tackled and tackled by a member of a firm which was already reputed to be doing all kinds of weird and extraordinary things but whereas it was quite obvious that john martin was greatly perturbed his eyebrows were working nervously and his lips and fingers twitching curtis on the other hand was as cool as possible he literally did not turn a hair now gentlemen he said turning to the referees keep your eyes well skinned and observe everything i do ladies and gentlemen he went on raising his voice i am now about to show you how the coffin trick is done observe me i'm the corpse mr kelson here is the operator and matt kelson rather to hamar's annoyance advanced down the stage to take part in the proceedings watch me get into the sack he stepped into it as he spoke look at what i have in my hand he went on holding up his right hand in full view of the audience i have a plug of wood covered with the same material as this sack as soon as i stoop down and the sack is pulled over me i shall thrust this plug into the mouth of it and mr kelson will bind the sack round it i shall then be put into the coffin you think you know this coffin but you don't see and stepping out of the sack he tapped the head of the coffin which was very broad and deep come closer and he beckoned to the referees whose numbers were now augmented by three newspaper reporters representatives of the daily snapper the planet and the hooter respectively here is a secret panel worked by a spring i will press and you will press too and amidst a breathless silence the nine members of the audience on the stage following every movement curtis put his hand inside the head of the coffin and touched a very slight elevation in the wood in an instant by a wonderfully neat piece of mechanism a panel slid back leaving just sufficient room for a man of moderate dimensions to squeeze through everyone now looked at john martin he was leaning back in his chair breathing hard his eyes starting out of his head his cheeks white hamar saw him and grinned grinned malevolently but the smile died out of his face when he glanced at gladys the scorn in the girl's eyes made his blood boil all right miss martin he muttered between his teeth you adopt that attitude now but you will adopt a very different one later on i'll win you body and soul or my name is not what it is he was interrupted in this amiable reflection by curtis i'm too stout to play the role of the corpse and so is matt curtis said to him you must undertake that part now he went on take this plug and get into the sack and he whispered a few instructions in his ears then he tied the top of the sack in reality tying it round the plug hamar was holding and one of the audience sealed the knot curtis and kelson then lifted hamar into the coffin shut the lid and corded it then curtis turning to the audience said what is now happening inside the coffin is this the corpse pulls the plug out of the mouth of the sack from the inside the cord thus becomes loose and the corpse is able to open the sack he at once touches the spring i pointed out to you in the head of the coffin and the panel slides back so and as the audience looked they saw the panel slide back and first all of hamar's head and then his body wriggle through the aperture thus made the reason why you audience cannot see him make his escape is this curtis explained the head of the coffin is always turned away from you and placed against a mirror which you can't see and which to you appears but the continuation of the stage in this mirror exactly opposite the head of the coffin is an aperture and it is through this the corpse makes his exit to the back of the stage i will show it you here it is and beckoning to the referees to come quite close he pointed to a glass screen 
in the centre of the base of which was a glass trap door corresponding in height and girth to the head of the coffin here corpse curtis said crawl through and hamar looking as if he by no means appreciated the undignified task of wriggling on his stomach before so many eyes drew himself as tight together as he could and squirmed through does that satisfy you gentlemen curtis inquired perfectly the referees answered nothing would be plainer we see exactly now how the trick is done at this there was a loud outburst of clapping and curtis bowed in the elegant manner in which he had been patiently and assiduously coached by kelson he then proceeded to the second trick eve at the window a trick almost if not quite as famous as the brass coffin and for the solution of which martin and davenport had frequently offered huge sums of money a large pane of glass some six by nine feet in area and set in a frame made to represent that of a window is placed on the stage about eighteen inches from the floor thirty-six inches from the ground a wooden shelf is placed against the window an assistant usually a woman then mounts on the shelf and looking out of the glass proceeds to kiss her hand vigorously the operator in a shocked voice asks her to desist she refuses and to the amusement of the audience carries on her pantomimic flirtation more desperately than before the operator pretends to lose his temper and snatching up a screen places it at the back of her he then fires a pistol pulls aside the screen and she has vanished as the top bottom and sides of the window all in fact except the very middle have been in full view of the audience and as the window has been tightly closed all the time the disappearance of the girl completely mystifies the audience curtis explained it all he pointed out that the keynote to the illusion lay behind the wooden shelf which was so placed as to conceal the fact that the lower part of the window was made double the bottom of the upper part being concealed from view by a second sheet of silvered glass placed in front of it the shelf covers the line of junction and enables the window frame to be scrutinized by the audience as soon as the screen is put in front of the lady on the shelf the glass pane slides up about a foot and a half into the top of the frame purposely made very deep the bottom of the window is cut away in the middle leaving an aperture about two feet square which was previously hidden from view by the double glass at the base eve makes her exit through this hole and slides on to a board placed behind the window in readiness for her the pane of glass then slides down again the screen is removed and the window appears just as solid as before when curtis concluded his verbal explanation he gave the audience a practical illustration of how the thing was done he manipulated the screen and pistol whilst hamar posed as eve and directly he had finished there was another outburst of applause kelson dared not look at john martin or gladys the brief glance he had taken of them at the conclusion of the giving away of the first trick had shocked him and he purposely stood with his back to them with hamar it was otherwise the joy of triumph was strong within him and the picture of john martin leaning forward in his chair with his mouth half open and a dazed glassy expression in his eyes only thrilled him with pleasure he laughed at the old man and still more at gladys that's the way to treat a girl of that sort he whispered to kelson scoff at her scoff at her well let her see you don't care a snap for her in the end she'll run after you and haunt you to death i'm not so sure kelson said it might act in some cases perhaps but i don't think you can quite depend on it pooh you are no judge of women in spite of all your experience hamar retorted i'll bet you anything you like she'll come round and make a tremendous fuss of me supposing you fall in love with her how about the compact kelson asked you've warned me often enough oh but i'm not like you hamar replied there's nothing soft in my nature i fall in love not much why you might as well have apprehensions of my joining the salvation army or wanting to become a militant suffragette either would be just about as possible no i shall make the girl love me and we shall be engaged for just as long as i please if i find some one that attracts me more i shall throw her aside if not maybe i shall marry her but in either case there will be no question of love at least not on my part 
she shall do as i want that is all hello curtis is beginning again there were five other tricks on the program all of which were world-renowned they were the floating head the mango seed the haunted bathing machine the girl with the five eyes and the vanishing bicycle illusion as with the first two tricks so curtis did with the following five he explained them and then aided by hamar and kelson gave practical demonstrations of their solutions and so thoroughly and clearly were these solutions demonstrated that the referees asked no questions they were absolutely satisfied turning to the audience at a sign from curtis they announced that the whole of messieurs martin and davenport's tricks had been solved to their entire satisfaction and that messieurs hamar curtis and kelson of the modern sorcery company limited had without doubt won the wager have you anything to say curtis asked addressing john martin i acknowledge my defeat though i do not understand it john martin said with very white lips i shall pay you the ten thousand pounds to-night not worry about that hamar interposed we don't want to take your money all we wanted to do was prove to you we could perform the tricks you believed to be insoluble ladies and gentlemen he went on raising his voice the modern sorcery company limited has given you some proof to-night of their capabilities in the conjuring line and if you will give us the pleasure of your company to-morrow night we invite you all free of charge for the occasion we will give you a still further demonstration of our powers may we count upon your patronage a terrific storm of clapping was the reply and as the audience slowly filed from the hall john martin staggered into the wing reeled past gladys ere she could catch him and sank helplessly on to the floor end of chapter twelve read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter thirteen of the sorcery club by elliot o'donnell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter thirteen the modern sorcery company limited give a gratis performance the days that followed were dark days for gladys her father whom she loved and until now had never realized how much she loved lay seriously ill he had had a stroke which although fortunately slight must as the doctor said be regarded as a prelude to what would happen unless he was kept very quiet and to keep him quiet was not an easy thing to do his mind continually reverted to what had just taken place and he was forever asking gladys to tell him whether anything further had occurred in connection with it whether there was anything about it in the papers gladys of course was obliged to dissemble she hated anything approaching dissimulation but on this occasion there was no help for it and what she told john martin was the reverse of what she knew to be actually happening the papers were full to overflowing with accounts of that fatal night's proceedings and of the marvellous gratis exhibition given on the succeeding evening by the modern sorcery company limited the hooter for example had a full column on the middle page headed in large type extraordinary scene and martin and davenport's the greatest conjuring tricks in the world solved whilst the daily snapper determined to be none the less sensational began thus mysteries no longer the brass coffin trick and eve at the window done at last martin and davenport lose their prestige this was bad enough but the planet published a paragraph that was even more galling now that monsieurs martin and davenport's great illusions have been explained in their hall in kingsway so long famous as the home of puzzledom of necessity shorn of its glamour one need not be surprised if those who delight in this kind of mystery should turn elsewhere for their amusement the british public which is above all things enamoured of novelty will doubtless now resort to the modern sorcery company whose house in cockspur street bids fair to become the future home of everything uncanny their programme to the uninitiated presents possibilities and impossibilities so said the planet 
and as the number of attendances at martin and davenport's fell from eight hundred twenty on the night of the challenge to eighty nine on the succeeding night whilst the modern sorcery company's hall was filled to overflowing there was every prospect of its prediction being verified the solution of martin and davenport's tricks had taken place hamar had so planned it on the last night the trio possessed the property of divination and consequently on the night that terminated the first stage of their compact the following night they would be in possession of new powers such powers as would warrant them giving a gratis exhibition an exhibition of jugglery absolutely new and unprecedented that the exhibition was successful may be gathered from the following article in the daily cyclone marvellous display of psychic phenomena in cockspur street the modern sorcery company limited in their new premises in cockspur street gave the most remarkable display of phenomena it has ever yet fallen to our lot to report indeed the performances were of such an extraordinary nature that the huge audience en masse was scared not a few people fainted whilst every now and again were heard screams of terror intermingled with long protracted ohs a brief resume of the entertainment ran as follows the first part of the modern sorcery company's programme was carried out by mr leon hamar solus who stepping to the front of the stage announced that he was about to give a display of clairvoyance without further prelude he pointed to various members of the audience and described spiritual presences he saw standing behind them he did not say he could see a spirit answering to the name of james or george or some such equally familiar name and then proceed to give a description of it so elastic that with every little stretching it would undoubtedly have fitted nine out of every ten people one meets with every day but unlike any other clairvoyance we have known he described the individual physical and moral traits of the people he professed to see for example to a lady sitting in the third row of the stalls he said there is the phantasm of an elderly gentleman standing behind you he has a vivid scar on his right cheek that looks as if it might have been caused by a sabre cut he has a grey military moustache a very marked chin wears his hair parted in the middle and has light blue eyes that are fixed ferociously on the gentleman seated on your left do you recognize the person i am describing i think so the lady answered in a faint voice i will spare you a description of his person hamar went on but i should like to remind you that he met with a rather peculiar accident he was looking over some engineering works in leeds when some one pushed him and he was instantly whipped off the ground by a piece of revolving mechanism and dashed to pieces against the ceiling am i right there was no reply but the sigh we think was more significant than words mr hamar then turned to a lady in the next row i can see behind you he said an old dowager with yellow hair she wears large emerald drop earrings black satin skirt and a heliotrope bodice of which she appears to be somewhat vain she is coughing terribly she died of pneumonia brought about by the excessive zeal of <clears throat> of her relatives for the open-air treatment contrary to expectations however all her money went to a society in hanover square a society for the anti-propagation of children i think you know the lady to whom i refer mr hamar had again hit the mark only too well came the indignant and spontaneous reply mr hamar then turned to a man in the fifth row hullo he exclaimed what have we here an irish terrier answering to the name of peg it is standing upright with its two front paws resting on your knees it is looking up into your face and its mouth is open as if anticipating a lump of sugar from the marks on its body i should say it has been killed by being run over again mr hamar was correct what you say is absolutely true the gentleman replied i had a dog named peg i was greatly attached to it and it was run over in piccadilly by a motorcyclist i hate the very sight of a motor bicycle after a brief interval of awestruck silence a voice from the gallery called out you are in league with him then the man in the stall stood up and essayed to speak 
but his voice was drowned in a perfect tornado of applause he had no need he was instantly recognized he was j b with a few more examples of clairvoyance mr hamar continued to entertain his audience for half an hour or so by the end of which time we have no hesitation in saying that everyone was convinced that he actually saw what he said he saw the second part of the programme was entirely in the hands of mr curtis who now came forward with a bow ladies and gentlemen he said you all know that man is complex that he is composed of mind and matter the material and immaterial i now propose to give you a physical demonstration of this fact will twelve of the audience kindly come up on the stage and sit around me so that you may feel quite certain that i have here no mechanical devices to assist me and amongst other well-known people who responded to mr curtis's request were lord bale sir charles tenningham and the right honourable john blaine m p having arranged these twelve volunteers in a semicircle at the back of the stage mr curtis standing in the centre of the stage again addressed his audience ladies and gentlemen he said the secret of separating the mind or what spiritualists who love to bolster up their pretended knowledge of the other world by the invention of pretentious nomenclature call the ethical ego from the body lies in intense concentration if you wish to acquire the power practice concentration concentrate on being in a certain place if nothing happens at first don't be discouraged but keep on trying and a time will come when you will suddenly leave your body in a form which is the exact counterpart of the body you have left you will visit the place whereon you are concentrating perhaps the best method of practising projection is to put your forehead against a door or wall and concentrate very hard on being on the other side it may take weeks before you get a result but if you persevere you will eventually succeed in leaving your physical form and passing through the door or wall into the space beyond now watch me i shall concentrate on projecting my immaterial body and of walking in it three times round my material body mr curtis closed his eyes and for some seconds appeared to be thinking very hard then the audience witnessed a remarkable phenomenon a figure the exact counterpart of mr curtis stepped out as it were from his body and slowly walking round it three times deliberately glided into it and apparently amalgamated with it the twelve members from the audience who were within a few feet of the alleged ethereal body as it walked past them declared they saw it most vividly and that feature for feature detail for detail it was the exact counterpart of mr curtis whose material body remained standing upright and motionless with its eyes tightly closed our representative questioned several of these eye-witnesses very closely and they were all most emphatic in their belief that what they had seen was a bona fide case of spiritual projection at the request of a large part of the audience mr curtis repeated his demonstration a further complement of men from the stalls joining those already on the stage to witness the operation several tests were now applied to the ethereal body of mr curtis as it walked round his material body one man clutching at its sleeve tried to detain it but his hand passed through the sleeve and held nothing another man put out an arm to act as a barrier and the projection without swerving from its course passed right through it and on the completion of the third round disappeared as before in answer to inquiries mr curtis stated that the phenomenon might be taken as a good illustration of projections and that he was prepared to project himself once again in order to prove that it was erroneous to suppose that phantasms could not do all manner of physical actions a deal table upon which stood a tumbler and jug of water a grandfather clock and a piano were brought on to the stage and mr curtis again projected his spirit form the latter at once walked to the table and taking up the tumbler filled it with water from the jug after which it wound up the clock and sitting down on a seat in front of the piano played killarney and the star-spangled banner and then amidst the wildest applause the first time assuredly a ghost has ever received public plaudits and recognition of its services it modestly re-entered its physical home 
mr curtis then announced that not only could he project his ethereal body from his material body in the manner he had already demonstrated but that with his ethereal body he could amalgamate with inorganic matter he bade those on the stage approach the table in convenient numbers that is two or three at a time and listen attentively he then took his stand on one side of the stage about fourteen feet from the table and the audience approaching the table and listening attentively first of all heard it pulsate as with the throbbings of a heart and then breathe with the deep and heavy respirations of some one in a sound sleep the table then raised itself some three or four inches from the ground and moved round the stage at the conclusion of which feat mr curtis informed the audience that table turning when not accomplished through the trickery of one of the sitters was frequently performed by the work of some earth-bound spirit usually an elemental that could amalgamate with any piece of furniture in precisely the same way as his own projection had amalgamated with the table in front of them elementals mr curtis continued are responsible for many of the foolish and purposeless tricks performed at seances and for the unintelligible and useless kind of answers the table so often wraps out the best you can hope for from an elemental is amusement it will never give you any reliable information nor will it ever do you any good with these words mr curtis share in the entertainment concluded he retired to the wings whilst mr kelson stepped forward begged those several gentlemen who on mr curtis's exit had reseated themselves among the audience once again to step up on to the stage be good enough he said addressing them in his most polite manner to observe me very closely i am about to give you a few further examples of what intense mental concentration can do thus proving to you to what an unlimited extent mind can gain dominion over matter you all know that will-power can overcome any of the internal physical forces for instance when you have tooth or earache you have only to say to yourselves i shan't suffer and the suffering ceases but what you may not know what you may not have realized is that will-power can overrule external forces and principles as for example gravity as a matter of fact airships and aeroplanes are absolutely superfluous and the time money and labor they involve is a prodigious waste any man with strong mental capacity can fly without the aid of mechanism he has only to will himself to be in the air and he is there look and to the amazement the indescribable unparalleled amazement of all present mr kelson knit his brows as if engaged in intense thought and jumping off his feet remained in the air at a height of some four feet from the floor at his request members of the audience came up to him and passed their hands under over and all around him to make sure there were no wires he then struck out with his hands and legs after the manner of a swimmer and moving first of all round the stage and then over the stalls and pit gradually ascended higher and higher till he reached the level of the boxes to the occupants of which he spoke such an extraordinary spectacle which apparently gives the lie to all our preconceived notions of gravity has certainly never before been witnessed and the effect it had on those who saw it baffles description when mr kelson returned to the stage and the terrific applause that greeted his arrival there had subsided he gave the audience a few valuable hints as to how they too might accomplish this feat practice concentration he said and develop your will-power if only by a very little every day jump off a stool to begin with saying to yourself as you do so i will remain in the air i won't touch the ground and though you may fail for the hundredth time if only you keep on trying you will eventually succeed to keep your equilibrium on a bicycle is a feat which would have been pronounced utterly impossible by your ancestors of two hundred years ago but just as that power came to you after many futile efforts all at once so in the end will flying come to you see i am now going to rise to the highest point in the building gravity pulls me back but i say to myself i will rise i will fly there and fly there i do and springing off the ground he struck out with his arms and legs flew swiftly and easily to the dome of the hall which he touched and then flew back again to the stage 
this completed the evening's entertainment if only on the strength of its first performance the modern sorcery company in our opinion has more than justified its name and although we understand they will give no more performances gratis we feel confident in prophesying that for many a long night there will be no falling off in the attendance End of chapter 13 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California Chapter 14 of The Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins Chapter 14 Shield to the Rescue gladys did not feel too happy when she read notices such as these she could not do other than see in them the destruction to her father and the worst of it all was that she could do nothing to help him who could who could possibly invent anything as wonderful as the marvels of the modern sorcery club limited and yet unless john martin gave up altogether that is what he must do nay he must do more he must not only equal the modern sorcery company's marvels he must eclipse them but after the affair of the challenge it seemed to gladys that there was no help for it the hall would have to be closed for a time now that dick davenport was dead there was no one to take her father's place on the night succeeding the catastrophe she had persuaded one of the indian attendants to undertake the role of operator but his skill was not equal to the tax upon it and the audience a poor one was very lukewarm in its applause the following day she talked the matter over with her father the latter was in favour of keeping the show on at any cost gladys for closing it temporarily a bad performance is worse than no performance she said much better to close till you have invented some new tricks john martin groaned i fear my days of invention are over he muttered if i can read the papers and write letters that will be about as much as i shall be able to do couldn't you retire i would if i were not a britisher john martin replied but being a britisher i'd sooner shoot myself than give in to a damned yankee and gladys in terror lest her father should overexcite himself promised that she would see that the entertainment was carried on as usual and that the indian continued on in the role of operator but when out of her father's presence gladys gave way to despair how could she a woman hope to cope with such a difficult situation and she was racking her brains to know how to act for the best when shiel was announced a wave of relief swept over her she could explain her difficulties to shiel in a way that she could not to any one who had no knowledge at all of her father's affairs and she told him just how matters stood look here he exclaimed when she had finished why not let me take your father's place at the kingsway i have done a little amateur acting and am not nervous at the thought of appearing in public your father confided in you so much you must know all his tricks by heart couldn't you coach me gladys looked at him critically it wouldn't be half a bad idea she said supposing you come with me to the hall i can explain the tricks better if i show you the apparatus at the same time shiel thoroughly enjoyed the journey up to town he knew it was wrong of him to think of his own pleasure when the affairs of his companion were in such a critical condition he knew he ought not to look at her in the way he did as if she was the most precious thing in the world and he would give her his soul if she wanted it he knew that he a penniless artist without any prospects had no right to behave thus but her beauty appealed to him with a force he was entirely incapable of resisting and he went on looking at her in the way he knew he ought not to look at her simply because he couldn't help it he lunched with her at her club in dover street and then they taxied to the kingsway the doorkeeper the only living creature in the building saving themselves seemed to share in the general depression hanging over everything the great empty front of the house with its gloomy cavernous boxes and grim gray gallery the dark dismal flies the chilly wings all hushed and still and impregnated with the sense of desertion but with this man beside her who she knew would do anything he could to help the place did not look quite so bad to gladys as it had done the day before 
there was a ray of light now where before ebon blackness had prevailed without delay gladys rang up the indian attendants on the telephone and occupied the time prior to their arrival by describing to shiel how each of the tricks was done her pupil proved far more able than she had anticipated after several rehearsals he was able to go through the whole performance without a hitch when they had finished gladys stretched out her hand impulsively i don't know how to thank you enough she said you are a brick and if only you do half as well this evening as you have done now we shall get on swimmingly that is to say as well as we can expect until we can arrange a fresh programme if only you were an inventor if only i were if only i had money why what would you do gladys asked curiously give it to you give you every half penny of it but as i haven't any i mean to give you all the energy i possess instead why me M my father you mean no you shiel said impulsively both of you if you prefer it but you first me first that doesn't seem very lucid but i can't stay to hear an explanation now for if i miss the four-thirty train i shall miss my dinner which would indeed be a calamity and slipping on her gloves she hurried off forbidding shiel to escort her further left to himself shiel strolled along the strand into the victoria gardens where he bought an evening paper and sat down to read it the first thing that caught his eye was magic in london this morning the west end received a shock about twelve o'clock a gentleman fashionably dressed turned into bond street from piccadilly and when opposite monsieur's Truefitz, prepared to cross over the street happened just then to be blocked by a long line of taxis the gentleman however had no intention of waiting till they had passed measuring the distance from one pavement to the other with his eyes he jumped about fifteen feet into the air and cleared the intervening space without the slightest apparent effort a feat that literally paralyzed with astonishment all who beheld it on being remonstrated by a policeman who was highly perplexed as to whether such extraordinary conduct constituted a breach of the peace or not the gentleman calmly leaped over the policeman's head and striking out with arms and legs swam through the air continuing in this fashion the cynosure of all eyes even the traffic being suspended to watch him he passed along bond street into oxford street where he once more alighted on his feet on being questioned by a representative of the press it transpired that he was mr kelson one of the partners in the modern sorcery company limited whose wonderful performances at their hall in cockspur street have already been reported in these columns i should well like to know how that flying trick is done shiel said to himself according to kelson it is entirely a question of will-power i'll see if i can't develop my concentrative faculty and introduce a few of the same performances in our show i'll go to the hall and try them now but his preliminary efforts were certainly far from successful he jumped off chairs saying to himself i will fly i will fly and he struck out heroically each time but the result was always the same gravity conquered he fell had he not been so much in love with gladys he would have desisted as it was the more he bumped and bruised himself the more determined he was to go on trying in fact flying with him became a mania and according to the daily journals his was by no means the only case all over england people were trying to fly an old lady in gypsy hill appeared in the police court to answer a charge of causing annoyance to her neighbours by practising flying from off her bed at night her bulk being large and her will-power apparently small she yielded to gravity and landed on the ground with prodigious bumps which set everything in the room vibrating and which could be plainly heard in the adjoining houses through the thin brick walls on either side of her room an old gentleman in gillsborough had an extremely narrow escape being warned on no account to practise flying in the house or garden lest his grandchildren should see him and want to do the same he retired to the seclusion of an old disused and dilapidated coach-house here in the upper story he practised by the hour together he climbed on a stool which he had taken there for the purpose and when he fancied he had acquired the right amount of concentration he sprang into the air arriving presumably through want of will-power on the floor 
For two whole days he practiced. Bump, bump, bump. And the more he bumped, the more he persevered. At last, however, the floor gave way, and with loud cries of, I will, I will, he fell on the ground floor, ten feet below. He was unable to go on experimenting, owing to a broken leg and a fractured collarbone. At Islesham, Norfolk, there had been a perfect epidemic among the children for trying ironic gravity. Rudolph Crabb, aged five, after listening to an account of the performances at the Modern Sorcery Company's Hall, which his father had read aloud, sprang off the dining-room table, crying out, I will fly, I will stay in the air. Fortunately, he fell on the tabby cat, which somewhat broke the shock of concussion, and he escaped unhurt in college road clifton bristol an octogenarian thinking he would add novelty to the jubilee celebrations at the college leaped off the roof of his house crying i'll fly over the close i will fly over the close and he broke his neck in st ives cornwall where the treatment of animals is none too humane a fisher boy threw a visitor's pomeranian over the malakoff saying you shall fly you shall remain in the air whilst at bath a girl of ten snatching her baby brother from the perambulator leaped over beach and cliff calling out we will fly together we will fly together these are only a few of the many similar cases shiel read in the paper and which he narrated afterwards to gladys martin i am quite convinced gladys said that kelson does his flying through supernatural agency his assertion that it can be done through mere will-power is sheer humbug it wouldn't be a bad idea to consult the clairvoyant. What do you think? Shiel thought it was an excellent suggestion. He saw in it an opportunity of spending yet another afternoon in Gladys's company, and asked her to go with him to an occultist the very next day. When she assented, the pleasure of it tingled through every pore of his skin. Of course, Gladys assured herself there was no harm in her acceptance of Shiel's escort, that neither he nor she meant anything by it that it was on her part merely a sort of acknowledgment that he had been awfully good to her in her present predicament besides if she needed further excuse she had no reason for supposing shiel to be in love with her and had her father not spoken to her about it she would not have remarked anything different in his glances from the glances for the time being perhaps earnest enough bestowed upon her by other young men which excuse was certainly in gladys's case a more or less honest one they had some difficulty in selecting a psychometrist so numerous were those who advertised in an equally alluring manner but they at length decided in favour of madame elvita whose consulting rooms were in new bond street when they arrived there madame elvita was of course engaged shiel was delighted it gave him an extra half hour with gladys when madame was free she had much to tell them first of all she spoke to them of karma's Kamadevas, Rupadevas, vitalized shells, etheric doubles, the Nirmanakaya, and afterwards solemnly announced that she must relapse into a state of clairvoyance in order to get in touch with Tilly Toot, a certain spirit from whom she could learn all that Gladys and Shiel wanted to know. Accordingly, in the manner of most other two guinea clairvoyants, she composed herself in a graceful and recumbent attitude made a lot of queer grimaces and still queerer noises, and spoke in a falsetto voice which proposed to be that of Tilly Toot, once a barmaid in Edinburgh, now one of Madame's familiar spirits. And the gist of what Tilly told them was that Hamar and company derived their powers from black magic, and that the secrets thereof could only be learned from Madame, after a series of sittings with her sittings for which madame would only require a fee of fifty guineas a most moderate in fact quite trifling sum considering the wonderful instruction they would receive but madame's magnanimous offer tempted neither gladys nor shiel and they abruptly took their departure Kateroski, nee jones in regent street whom gladys and shiel had agreed to consult in the event of a non-successful visit to madame elvita in bond street also told them that black magic was the key to hamar curtis and kelson's performances she advised them to get on the astral plane where they would meet spirits who would give them all the information they desired madame kateroski's instructions were simple it is really a matter of faith she said all you have to do is go to some secluded spot 
the privacy of your bedroom will do admirably sit down close your eyes look into your lids and concentrate hard after a while you will no longer see your eyelids your lids will fade away and you will be on the astral plane and see strange creatures which although terrifying won't harm you when you get used to them you will communicate with them and learn from them all you want to know shall we try gladys remarked laughingly at shiel as they stepped into the street but if faith is essential to success i fear failure as far as i am concerned is a foregone conclusion i know i shouldn't have sufficient faith nor i either shiel said but perhaps we could acquire a necessary amount of it if we were to experiment together supposing we try in that delightfully secluded copse in your garden gladys shook her head i'm afraid it would be useless besides if my father were to hear of it he would fear worry had turned my brain and most likely have another fit no we must think of something more practical in the meanwhile if you will keep on with the part you have so generously undertaken you will be doing me an inestimable service then i'll stop on with it for ever shiel replied and before she could stop him he kissed her hand end of chapter fourteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california